we are very, very pleased to uh, welcome uh, Tom Mans as uh, our first um, uh, invited speaker. Uh, he has prepared a presentation which is uh, um, totally directed to um, PhD students and uh, postdocs and young researcher in general, um, giving practical advices on uh, how to uh, success during uh, the PhD, uh, during their PhD. So um, Tom has a, a lot of experience in being a PhD student himself uh, in the past time, as some of us here. Uh, and also he has an experience in um, uh, being a, a, a mentor for PhD students and, a, and an advisor also. I can't see your. I can't see you. I see your slide, but. I... So um, sorry. So um, the the talk is going to be uh, very practical, and I'm sure it's going to provide uh, very useful information for. Um, the young researchers and maybe um, to older researchers also. So uh, I'm very glad that you, that we have you, Tom. And um, if you want to start, you're welcome. Okay, thank you for the introduction. So if you don't mind, I will stand up. Uh, well, that's why you see me a bit strange on the on the video. Um, okay, so. Um, yeah, so today I will talk to you about uh, basically all the advices I can give you. Uh, to become a successful PhD student, so it's this is like uh, well, when when you started to ask me uh, to give a presentation like this, uh, it was a, a bit difficult for me to know where to start. So I actually did it by asking around me to all my current PhD students, all the postdocs uh, that I have, uh, I'm currently or I have been um, uh, helping around, and also my former PhD students to let me know what is the uh, advice they they would find most beneficial to give to new or ongoing PhD students. So that's what the talk will be about. Um, so yeah, on this first slide, I will also share the slides with you after the talk. Um, I will also put them on LinkedIn and on well, whatever platform you want and share them with uh, the organizers as well. So then you can see and learn from this at your ease. Um, okay. How to go to the next slide? Okay, switch screen. Yeah. So basically, uh, just a historical uh, overview. So I have been a PhD student a long, long time ago. Uh, 1993, I started. So that's uh, okay. Uh, too long ago to even start counting. Uh, I had a PhD student. I was actually a teaching assistant. So this means that I had six years. It's a luxury uh, to do a PhD student uh, to do to, to do a PhD because it was 50% uh, teaching load. And then I became a postdoc researcher uh, at the, the, the National Science Foundation for three years. And then since 2003, I have been uh, appointed as a first assistant and associate and full professor at the University of Mons, where I still am. Um, and, uh, on, and, and on this behalf, I have been uh, able to be an advisor of PhD students for many years. Uh, and also um, I've been advising postdocs also for many years now. So uh, here you can see, um, it's not all of them, but like the most recent ones that uh, have finished their PhD. If they finished it, the year is uh, indicated. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can also see, I don't know if you can see actually my pointer when I point to this. Uh, do you see my pointer or not? Yeah, yes. okay. Uh, so you can see Eleni and Alexandra who are two postdocs. All of the others are either former PhD students or uh, current PhD students. Uh, there's perhaps also my leak who is actually also postdoc, but not in my uh, team. Uh, actually, also Eleni is no longer in my team, but she used to be a postdoc in my team. So these are the persons that I have asked advice for uh, preparing this uh, slide. Actually, some of them are also here today. Uh, they will also do a presentation today in uh, uh, one of the next uh, sessions. Uh, okay, so now um, basically, okay. Uh, if you are a PhD student, it's not very easy to be a PhD student as well. I think all PhD students can testify this. It's like being a, how do you call it, a juggler trying to uh, use one hand or two hands to try to uh, keep three balls in the air all the time. Uh, actually, this guy is cheating because he still has one of the two, three balls in his hand. So they should all be up all the time. Uh, so this is something that you need to learn. It's, it takes a lot of experience, but uh, once you get the hang of it, it's uh, feasible to do. 
once you are a perfect uh, juggler like this, you can say that you have uh, reached your, uh, uh, your, you're able to finish your PhD. Uh, then, of course, the next step is if you're a postdoc, it's a little bit more difficult because you will need to juggle with like, I think, six or seven balls uh, simultaneously. If you're a very good postdoc, maybe you only need a single hand like this guy that's uh, to do this uh, juggling. Uh, and then, of course, uh, you come to the next level, which is professor, where you have to like uh, juggle all the time with 15 balls in the, on, uh, in the air and perhaps like 30 balls on the floor <laughs> that you still have to try to pick up uh, while, while juggling. Uh, so that's uh, so it always becomes more and more challenging. But of course, with experience, you are able to uh, to uh, to do more and more things. So it's something that you need to learn. So what is the practical advice I can give you to come to this uh, level? Uh, well, there is lots of practical advice. I try to put this in like focused slides. So I try to structure a bit. Uh, basically, focus and structure is two of the advices I can already give you. So how can you actually focus? Basically, it's focus is one of the most important things when you do your PhD. Uh, it depends. Sometimes when you do a PhD, you might have had a PhD advisor that says, this is your research topic. This is what you have to do. So the goal is already set for you. In that case, that's the easy way out because, uh, well, you have to basically work towards a goal that has already been defined by you. In many cases, it's not really the case. Basically, your PhD advisor just says to you, this is a research domain. This is the research we want to focus on, but the clear goal uh, is still something that you need to define yourself. This is more interesting, but it's also more difficult. So there it's important to as soon as possible to start defining and setting the main goal of your PhD uh, and also to define the specific research questions that will help you to reach this goal. And once, uh, so this is something that you should define early on. Of course, you can always change it uh, on the fly whenever you see that your goal changes, it's still possible to do this, but you always need to have a goal and you need to have research questions towards this goal. Otherwise you cannot really advance towards the goal. So it's important to do this early and to define this clearly, and then you can work towards these targets uh, while doing your research. Um, of course, uh, sometimes you may uh, even, I, I also had this uh, a tendency to like diverge from the main goal, which is okay uh, from time to time, but you should not try to say, okay, I, first I'm going into this direction, then I'm going to, to the other direction. I have had, I had several examples of PhD students that actually they try to jump on everything that moves and whenever uh, they, there is a new interesting topic, they worked on it. And at the end, they had like lots of different research results, but it was quite difficult to merge them, to integrate them into a single coherent thesis topic. So having a single uh, goal is uh, more easy at the end because once you have to write up your PhD dissertation, you should try to fit all the publications that you have had in uh, this topic. So to do this, so you need to have a clear goal, you need to have a focus, and you need to have a well-structured way of doing things. Have a well-structured way of thinking, structure your daily work, plan uh, like saying this morning I'm going to do this, in the evening I'm going to do this, in this day of the week I'm going to do this. Also structure your writing, structure your codes. Uh, so it's very important to be very well-structured while you're uh, working towards your PhD, I think for any type of work, by the way. Um, and then also, uh, well, keeping your focus is not possible all of the time, as you know that thinking about a particular problem, like, I don't know, finding a new mathematical proof or doing some very hard coding, it's something that requires really a lot of concentration. It's not possible to be concentrated all of the time. So uh, after a while, you will need to alternate with some more lightweight activities that, uh, that don't lead as much uh, brain power, otherwise your brain will explode. So for example, then you can take on other duties. Uh, for example, you could, you could start talking with some colleagues, do some perhaps some writing, which is less intensive, uh, prepare some presentations, maybe correct some exams, whatever. <laughs> uh, but so uh, alternate activities that require a lot of concentration with those that require less concentration. These are just some, uh, some guidelines, some suggestions. Uh, okay, by the way, when I'm talking, I will also keep an eye on the questions and answers. So if you have questions while I'm talking, just uh, list them in the question and answers. And if, if I see them coming up, I might respond immediately interactively. So you don't have to wait raising questions until the end of the presentation. Okay, uh, so another thing is, so I said, uh, okay, it, you should not, you should avoid having too many uh, loose ends, uh, but this doesn't mean that you sh that it's, it's, you shouldn't have any sidetracks. 
it's okay to, from time to time, work on some different topic that is not part of your main PhD goal, but do not exaggerate too much, limit the amount of effort you invest uh, in it, especially when you're nearing the, the end of your PhD, because, uh, yeah, so you can do it if you plan ahead and if you know that it's feasible uh, to do so. Um, okay, so this is actually brings me to the next one, which is actually planning and tracking. Once you know the goal, you know where you can go, uh, where, where you need to go, you can start planning ahead. Uh, when you want to do this planning, basically there's three levels of planning. You can plan at the short term, at the medium term, and at the long term. At the short term, typically it is, okay, you have a specific goal, you have a specific research question, and then you say, okay, the answer to this research question, I hope this will be ready by three months. In three months, there is an upcoming conference uh, deadline. I'm going to submit the results for this goal uh, at that conference. You need to plan this well ahead of time because uh, you need uh, you know you need to see is it feasible to finish all of these results by the conference deadline if you don't think it's feasible then you should probably go for another deadline if you think it's feasible you should start planning to avoid having to do everything last minute uh, medium term there's lots of things you can do at a, a more medium term but typically research visits uh, so it's always good to have like longer term, longer time research visit, like three months or six months to another team. If you want to do this, probably you will need to get funding for this. And maybe you have to plan like six months or nine months, even one year ahead of time. So this takes a little bit more planning. Uh, and in, it, at the longer term, of course, you have to finish your PhD. Your PhD will take probably like, it depends, somewhere between three and six years, I would say, depending on where you are, is it in France or in Belgium, or if it's a, a full-time or a part-time uh, PhD position. Um, so this is uh, more long-term planning. And then even longer time is uh, what do you want to do after the PhD? It's not because you're doing a PhD right now that you shouldn't already like plan uh, after the PhD. If you already know during your PhD that you want to stay in an academic career, then I think it's important to focus on everything towards this academic career and focus on completing your CV with all of those things that matter for a academic career. For example, I mentioned research visits. Academic mobility is considered very important. So you should probably focus on this during your PhD to be able to, at the longer term, get a, a professor position after your PhD. If you don't want to stay in academy, but you want to do uh, something in companies, then you might focus on having some collaboration with companies during your PhD. So it really depends on what your long-term goal is. Uh, another thing like for planning is uh, that's uh, difficult to estimate, but once you have say uh, that you have already like uh, four publications uh, that have been accepted and published, and then you still have to write a PhD dissertation. It's something that's typically underestimated. Uh, uh, people say, okay, I have everything that's written, now I still have to write my PhD and that's it. Uh, and then uh, how much time do you think it will take? Well. Um, I always ask this my students, most of them say it will take three months for sure, not more than that, but in every single occasion it took always six months, sometimes more, to really start doing the writing, the full writing of the dissertation, even with all of the publication material already published somewhere. So this is definitely something that should not be underestimated. Um, Another thing is that, of course, we are really living in a fast evolving world. Everything is evolving very fast. Technology is evolving. The research field is evolving. There's new publications being published uh, all the time. So you need to continuously keep track of things. What are the new publications? What are the new tools? Uh, what is the new technology? Um, and uh, because well, you need this, because you need to, to integrate this as part of the state of the art in your uh, research. Uh, and also your own research activities also need, you also need to keep track of the, this. Okay, again, it depends on in which university you are, but for example, in our university, I think uh, in France as well, every year you need to do an annual report for your PhD advisory committee, where you have to say, this is what I did. Okay, you can do this once a year, but I think it's much easier to, whenever you have uh, done something, you just store it somewhere and you keep track of this all the time in a continuous way rather than having to spend much more effort once every year to uh, try to find back what did I do which day, uh, or even worse, uh, say that only at the end of your PhD, you're going to write your CV and you have to go back four years in time to see what, uh, try to remember what I did uh, four years ago. So it's always easier to keep track of things continuously rather than uh, having to look back in time like many, many months uh, before. Uh, so I already mentioned mobility, research visits as something very important uh, for PhD students. 
So you should always uh, seize the opportunity if you can to travel and reach out. If you can, because I, as you all know, the last two years was not always possible to do this traveling. Even today, we are in a virtual conference, which was not possible uh, either. Um, so take the opportunities while you can, because it's really very useful to do so. Okay, wait, I see they have one question here. Uh, where is it? Maybe it's my own question. Just a minute. No. No, it's okay. There's no specific question. Okay, uh, so what is the type of mobility that you could do? The easy thing is, of course, attending scientific events, workshops, conferences, seminars, summer schools, any type of scientific event that's organized. Uh, there's a lot of variety. Try to embrace this variety and not only attend conferences, but also go to summer schools once in a while, especially early on in your PhD, and also attend workshops because workshops, they are quite different from conferences. They are much more interactive. So you get to interact with uh, other like-minded people. Uh, attending these conferences, attending these scientific events is really very useful uh, because this is really the place where you get to know and to talk to other people that are doing similar research as you do. So you have a kind of, um, uh, well, uh, you, you can discuss about your research with these people. You can hopefully even use this to foster new future research collaborations. Uh, or uh, if you go somewhere uh, where you're, uh, you can also complain about your uh, advisor, uh, which is also sometimes useful to, uh, to do. Um, it also allows you to keep up to date in your research fields that's evolving fast. It increases also your own visibility. People will get to know, know you, people will get to remember you. That's also very important, um, especially for conferences. Uh, probably one of the most important thing in conferences is not attending to all of the talks, but actually attending the social events, the social events, the coffee breaks. This is the place where you get to know people, where you get to talk to people, and where you can get uh, connect to people. So the social aspects of these events is much more important than like the scientific uh, events. You can always, of course, I, I'm not saying that you shouldn't go and listen to the talks, you should, but you should really embrace the, the social events that surround it, because this is where you get to know and talk to people and understand more in depth what they are doing and how it's related to your research and also to promote, of course, your own research to them. So that's about attending scientific events. And the other part is about doing research visits. So typically, a research visit is always seen as a very interesting thing while doing a PhD. Uh, it depends on your needs and on your availability. Uh, this can be short research visit, like one month, but it can go up to three months, six months, even 12 years. Uh, 12 months, sorry, 12 years would be a bit too much. Uh, if you do this, of course, you have to, again, plan this. Um, so uh, don't just do a research visit, for example, to, I don't know, to uh, Spain because the weather is fine is in Spain and the food is good. No, try to select a lab that fits the scope and the needs of your research. Go to somewhere that is uh, the best fit for the goal that you have in mind. Uh, once you go there, of course, it's good because it's in, it boosts your CV, it increases your mobility, it allows you to broaden your scope, your research vision. You go to perhaps a new country, a new language, a new culture. Uh, everything uh, helps you to grow as a person. It also helps you to grow your research network and your research collaboration. So I can only see uh, positive things there. Um, okay, another thing is, uh, yeah, sometimes, uh, oh, research visits, uh, they can also be shorter. They don't have to be one month. It can also be much shorter research visits. For example, this is a, just an anecdote. Uh, another PhD student of mine who was working more in, in virtual reality and augmented reality. Uh, he needed to do some experience, some tools with some real machines. So in this case, it was like uh, this, uh, this table, uh, this uh, interactive table and also a 360 degree uh, around you. There were all screens that were all, all interactive uh, with lots of cameras everywhere. It's a really very expensive infrastructure that you cannot find anywhere. So this guy needed, uh, my PhD student uh, needed to use this for his experiments, which is about uh, parametric architectures for creating buildings. Uh, and uh, to do so, uh, basically I sent him to the University of Luxembourg where they had this infrastructure. It was really beneficial to both parties. 
uh, he got to know the tools and they got to, um, to benefit from his experience. It even resulted in a number of publications uh, together. Um, so this was really for learning a new specific technology, but it also ended up in fostering new research collaborations. Okay, so that's uh, about goals, planning and tracking. Then the next one is about using tools. Uh, of course, we are all, all, we are humans. All humans are using tools. In our specific case, we are using software tools because we are in software engineering. Uh, so you should always use the right tools for the right purpose. Uh, so of course, there is all the generic tools that everyone uh, is using, uh, but I'm still going to insist on them. Uh, if you want to do your research, you always need a good backup uh, cloud storage or whatever mechanism. I have seen too many cases of PhD students losing a lot of work, several days, sometimes several weeks or months of work because they didn't have a proper backup. They just had their own hard disk, it crashed and they lost everything. Um, antivirus tool, same thing. Uh, you have a virus, uh, it breaks everything on your machine and you don't have a backup, so you're screwed. Um, video conferencing, that's especially useful even today. Uh, so um, this has become more important. It's not always perfect to use video conferencing, but it really helps you in life for connecting to people that are at the other side of the ocean uh, to talk to them without needing to go there uh, all the time. So also use these tools, whatever preferred video conferencing mechanism you need. Uh, then if you're really developing software, then typically to, to, today, nowadays, we are working in a collaborative software development environment. So I guess you will need to use social coding platforms like GitHub and GitLab, version control tools like Git, uh, Slack for, uh, for the social aspects for communicating with your fellows uh, about, uh, about this uh, software development uh, and so on. So this is just some generic tools. Specifically for research, we also need tools for preparing our papers and presentations. Again, I don't think I'm seeing anything new here. You take whatever your, is your preferred way of writing papers. In scientific community, we use LaTeX. So we have a, probably some standalone LaTeX tool on the machine or some collaborative LaTeX tool like uh, Overleaf, uh, perhaps Beamer for creating presentations with LaTeX or Keynote and PowerPoint for creating your presentations or any other tool uh, that is doing something similar. Uh, so that's again, rather generic. More specific is, okay, one of the most difficult things as you're a PhD researcher is where can I find the references that are good for me in my specific field? So how can I find bibliog bibliographic references and how can I manage them? For finding them, uh, this is the first bullet. You can see lots of different tools. The ones that I tend to use mostly are Google Scholar, uh, DBLP, uh, IEEE, so the IEEE digital, digital Library, the ACM Digital Library, and then you also have those from the specific publishers, Springer and Elsevier. I have never found any, well, I, whenever I, I try to find a paper, I always find it on any of these. If I don't find it there, then I probably just send the mail to the authors to ask, can you please give me your paper? And they send it to me by mail. Uh, so that's more for finding references. So they all have a pretty good search engine. And then you also have tools for managing your bibliograph bibliographic references like Zotero, Mendeley. I'm pretty sure this list is not complete. So if you think about other tools, I should uh, add here for any of these topics um, for a new version of my slides, just let me know. A particular one that is quite recent that I uh, particularly like, uh, I like it so much that I'm going to have a specific slide on this is Research Rabbit. Uh, probably not, it's not that familiar, but uh, like, um, here is an example. So recently we have been working, my, one of my PhD students uh, who will finish his PhD next year is working on software development bots. So uh, basically what you can do is to say all of the research uh, around this topic, starting from a particular article that we have published ourselves, uh, we can say, okay, we want to know what is all of the research there. So you can start uh, iteratively by saying, I have one paper that's interesting. And then you can say, okay, oh, sorry, I'm going back. Uh, Sorry. Uh, so this was a paper that he published. And from this paper, you can say, give me all of the earlier work, give me all of the related later work or similar work. From this, you can select which are those that are appropriate. There is some, I think some artificial intelligence engine uh, behind it that tries to fit uh, based on the keywords, based on the contents of the paper, based on the abstract to find the most appropriate works. Based on this, you can see which ones are relevant. You're going to add it to the list. And like this, again, you can look and find more, more related work. 
like this very easily in, I think it doesn't take more than, at least for this one that I just did, did, did this more or less uh, last week. It didn't take me more than 30, uh, 30 minutes to find in this case, like 50 different relevant papers in this specific domain that probably cover like 95% of all of the papers in this uh, domain. So it's a really very effective way of storing, uh, keeping track of things because you can also store this of course. And then you, whenever there is new papers, uh, that emerge, you can always come back to this list and, and fill it in. You can also see here um, a social network, not only which papers, but also who is involved in this paper. I have tried to restructure this a bit by name of first author to see that basically this is a kind of research field in which everyone is referring to uh, everyone. Uh, it's a rather novel field that's only three, four years old. So uh, you can see who are the main uh, actors in, in this field. So this is a nice uh, interactive tool with a web interface that allows you can to easily in an incremental and um, dynamic way start exploring a particular field. Uh, again, it's not the only bibli bibliographic reference management software I'm using, but uh, it's one of the ones in which I recently find new information, especially because it also has a feature to, uh, to send you automatically by mail, whenever there is a new paper around, it sends you a notification so that you can continue adding. Uh, other things, of course, yeah. If you do research, you have lots of research artifacts. You have publications, tools, data sets, videos, presentations, you name it. And all of these, uh, well, you should not only focus on publications, you should share all of the research artifacts that are, that are of sufficient quality. You should share them with your peers. So to do so, you should use tools for this. Uh, for example, if you have code, you can share this with GitHub. If you have uh, papers, you typically use archive uh, slides, you use SlideShare, speaker deck. Um, so there's lots of different tools that you can use for sharing specific types of research artifacts. What's important is when you share them, make sure that they are of sufficient quality. Also make sure that whatever link you share is a permanent link so that uh, you don't share something and then two weeks later the link is gone and no one has access to it anymore. Um, and then of course, uh, once you have shared your research artifacts, regardless of whether it's a publication or something else, also uh, try to disseminate your research as uh, broadly as possible. Make your research known by exploiting social media. So use LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, whatever, to talk to people to let them know about your research. So create your social network to talk about the research that you have produced. Uh, okay, so here an example. So I'm just uh, as one of the examples, ResearchGate. I don't know which of these uh, tools you're using, but this one is also quite useful because it can uh, basically, if you can see here, it's a little bit small, but on the left-hand side, I have just taken, uh, this is for, for me personally, uh, I have, 348 different research artifacts that I have shared. Most of them are articles, but there's also books, chapters, data, technical reports. So you I can actually, if you can see here in the research items, you can use this platform to share different types of art, different types of research artifacts in different categories. All of them will be available. You can have metadata to it. So it's also a good way for yourself to store and share everything with your peers uh, in an easily accessible way. I'm not saying you should use this tool. I'm just saying that uh, there is uh, nice tools out there that can help you. Uh, another example is like whenever I have a presentation like this one today, I have my uh, YouTube uh, channel in which I will post uh, the videos so that people can always look back at uh, any presentation that I deem interesting for uh, the future generation. Um, Okay, talking about sharing your research results, this actually goes to the broader picture about open research. It's important to uh, engage in open research. You should, uh, as a researcher, you should make your research visible. Your research should be openly accessible to everyone and should adhere to the good standards for making your research open. So, uh, so I don't know you, uh, I invite you to go to this website, www.gofair.org, which talks about the fair principles of scientific research, which is basically making your research open, making it findable to other people, accessible. So it's not because you can find it that you can access it because you might have a link, but it, you have to pay for it. Uh, interoperable, you want your uh, research, your tools to work on other platforms, for example, reusable uh, and so on. 
Uh, how can we do this? There is lots of guidelines there. I only have one slide, but one of the things is, for example, whenever you share some uh, research artifact, have a DOI, a, a unique uh, document identifier, which is permanent, that always refers to the artifact that you share. Make whatever you can available in open access, if uh, the, the open access policy allows you to. Uh, share not only your papers, but also the data sets that you have uh, created, the benchmarks that you have created, the tools that you have created. If you create tools, try to the large extent possible, do it using open source tools, uh, so that not only the tools, but also the code for the tools is available. Of course, not everything applies. Sometimes you have to take into account uh, like uh, restrictions uh, because you're working with a company or something like this. And also create replication packages that allow other people to reproduce the results that you have created. This is especially the case in uh, when you're doing um, empirical research where you produce quantitative results uh, based on some data. So in that case, don't just share the paper, also share the data, also share the way in which you have obtained the results for your paper. And do this in a reproducible way, which means that it's not just a replication package. People should actually be able to read and to reproduce the replication package. It can take a lot of effort, but it pays off at the end, uh, because if people can do this, they will see that you're a really good researcher and uh, it helps. So one of the things that we tend to use for this is uh, Jupyter notebooks, especially when it's with Python code, but they, it, it also works for other programming languages. So here is just an example. Uh, I just took one example of some recent work. So uh, our latest IEEE transaction software engineering paper, which has this unique DUI. This is the paper. Uh, we shared the replication package using a unique link on Zenodo, again, with uh, another DOI link to it. I don't know by heart which is it. We have to really click on the link to find it. And then also we have the this replication package. It's also available on GitHub, which is where we developed it. And there all the code is available. Um, and where we can also keep track of the evolution of things. And basically it's Python code, but it's created in a Jupyter notebook. So you can have the executable Python code. You can just rerun all of the code yourself. The data is there. You can also even reproduce all of the results, the figures that are part of the paper uh, using this notebook. So this is fully repli replicatable. Okay, sometimes there can be issues like for perhaps because you don't have the latest version or Python or something, but at least um, the dependencies are also specified over there. So it makes uh, things much more easy for other people to see what are your results, how did you obtain the results, and see the full code of everything that you have done in every single step. This is the best recommended practice to, uh, to do. At least we try to adhere to it. Perhaps we do not always 100% adhere to it. Sometimes it's not possible either. For example, if you're working with social technical uh, data, sometimes for privacy reasons or for GDPR reasons, you're not able to share the data because it has to be anonymized. So then you have to make some trade-offs. Um, okay, same goes for tools and data sets. Whenever you produce tools, you should make them available. Uh, so here again, an example. This is another recent example. This was uh, uh, the PhD student, Mehdi, uh, who was uh, working on bots. Uh, so he had created a bot classification model. Bots are basically accounts that uh, in GitHub that are uh, automated. They are not human accounts. And we have a tool for detecting them automatically. So we have a paper about how to create a classification model for automatically detecting such accounts. We have a tool called Bodega that uh, is an open source tool with a command line interface that allows you to uh, run uh, this classification model on your own GitHub repository. And we have the, uh, this is the data set that is also shared uh, here. So basically the paper and the tool and the data set is uh, shared on three different links, all uh, with a unique DUI. Uh, and you can actually have access to the full open source code of the tool uh, on the GitHub repository, uh, where you also have all the necessary installation instructions on how to use the tool and a, a detailed readme file. Um, okay, uh, other advice, uh, well, well, I talked about mobility, talked about planning, tracking. Collaboration is also very important. Collaboration inside of your university, inside of your research group. So for example, it's uh, you should try to meet regularly with your research group. So ideally, in my case, for example, I try to have weekly meetings as a supervisor with all of my PhD students, uh, typically all of them together. And then on a neat basis, I also have uh, specific meetings with each of them separately. 
This depends, of course, on your availability. Uh, sometimes it can be bi-weekly meetings. Um, uh, if the supervisor is not available, you can also, of course, have brainstorms with other PhD students and postdocs that are more available all the time. Um, uh, you can also start collaborating with other researchers outside of your uh, group. So you should identify who are the other persons working on similar topics. That's why you have to go to conferences to meet these people. Uh, and once you have identified them, you can actually try to collaborate with them by writing papers, developing tools together, creating data sets together, and so on. Uh, you could also try to collaborate for ex example, something that I did when I was uh, doing my PhD, I already start to be engaged in workshops. I actually was co-organizing specific scientific workshops within my field of research to well, basically because I wanted to uh, engage in the, in the community. Uh, so that's also a way. Uh, and of course, uh, well, you have master students in your university uh, as a PhD uh, student, it's always good to propose master's thesis or master project topics that can be uh, followed, uh, can be done by master students so that uh, they can help you in your research. You can help them in their uh, uh, research. And whenever there is new results, perhaps the master students are that great that later on they also want to do a PhD in the team. And then, of course, uh, collaboration could also be with companies. If you have more uh, applied research or if you uh, want to do a, a later career in uh, in industry, then uh, probably you have to try to see how you can involve companies in your research. This is not always possible. It depends probably on the specific research domain you're working in. Publications, I guess we don't have to say that you should publish regularly, but publish regularly doesn't mean publish all the time. I think it's better to focus on quality rather than quantity. So do not go for short term gains and say, OK, I want to have like two publications every year, uh, go to uh, higher level uh, conferences, if you have some uh, results that look promising, but that still need some tweaking, perhaps it's better to wait a bit before actually publishing it uh, and focus, uh, try to focus always the best conferences. So A or A star rated conferences or journals, those that have a higher impact factor, those that ultimately will pay off uh, in the end. Uh, it might mean that you will have less publications at the end, but they will be of higher quality. Of course, you need to find a good balance between uh, uh, between this because I realize that, of course, you also need publications to be able to do a PhD and to finish your PhD. Uh, but don't go for just the very easy uh, conferences that might not have any impact at all. Um, once you have a publication, you should also try to share it again. Use social media and share your preprints with everyone else. By sharing the information, it will get known and it will get cited. If you don't share anything, no one will be able to cite it. Uh, and of course, it's not only publishing, it's also presenting. Whenever you have a, a, public, a, a publication, try to present it yourself uh, during live conferences, using uh, video uh, telecommunic uh, teleconferencing uh, or others, because presentation and communication skills are very important for a PhD researcher later in your career. Everywhere you need presentation and communication skills, so try to practice this as well. Uh, just uh, to come back to this A or A star, there are rankings that allow you to identify which are the good conferences. Uh, for example, this is just an example, there is the CAR conference rankings where you can see the top A star or A related conferences, in this case in the field of anything with software, uh, where you can, for example, see ICSI as one of the top ones or ISIC, FSC and AIC as the top A star rated conferences. Uh, our journal rankings, I don't think they, they stopped uh, maintaining these rankings, so there is no recent results anymore, but like uh, you can see TOSEM, TSC, Empirical Software Engineering, GSS, IST, the main conferences in software uh, that uh, you should preferably target uh, first. So these are like the good things, things that you should try to go for uh, as much as possible, taking into account the constraints that you have. Um, Christelle, how much time do I have left for my presentation? Uh, you can you can have uh, 15 minutes, it's okay. Yeah, yeah, I will try to do it in less than 15 minutes. Uh, actually, my presentation was um, structured in three different parts. One part was like the advices I could give. Then the second part, which I'm starting now, is the perils, what could go wrong and how can you avoid things going wrong. And then there's the third part that I will not have time to do today, which is the life after the PhD. 
what after the PhD, uh, if you want to go to a company or if you want to stay in research, what should you what should you do? This this material is present in my slides. Uh, I will not be able to uh, talk about it now, but I will share you the slides so you will have a look at be able to look at this as well. Um, okay, so perils. What is the problems that you should try to avoid when you're doing a PhD? Well, one of the things that's very important is to always ensure a good work-life balance to try to avoid the risk of burnout. To do so, you should actually don't neglect your family or friends. Uh, meet with your family, meet with your friends, do some sports, do some cultural activities, do some holidays. Do not neglect this. If you neglect this and only do research, you will risk a burnout. Of course, it's not always possible to do this all of the time. You, that's why you need planning. So you need to plan to be able to do this. Uh, because, of course, doing a PhD is not a nine to five job. You know that sometimes there will be upcoming de deadlines. If there is an upcoming deadline, perhaps you will have to occasionally work harder when this deadline is upcoming. But you can take this into account by planning well ahead and by not procrastinating. Some students, they have a tendency to wait until the last minute and then they start working uh, for three days in a row without sleeping. I don't think that's a good uh, attitude. <laughs> so it's something that you need to learn, of course. Um, if you plan well ahead, then you can avoid these types of things. Me, for example, personally, ideally, I try to finish my papers to, for upcoming deadlines like one week before the deadline. Uh, this never works, but at least in that case, I still have one week <laughs> to finish it uh, uh, because I still have one week more than I actually plan. Um, another one is getting stuck in your research. Uh, sometimes, actually, frequently it happens. It's happened in my case at least two or three times while I was doing my PhD that I actually, I didn't know how to proceed. I was stuck somewhere. I didn't get new results. I didn't know what to do. My papers got uh, rejected uh, several times. So in that case, every time this happens, you should actually don't uh, well, talk. You should talk about it with your advisor, with your colleagues to see how you can try to get out of the mud um, and to continue to move forward. Should I, is there any alternatives that I should explore? Should I actually change my research track entirely? Uh, sometimes it's actually some, something stupid that you're stuck in. Sometimes it's actually just a, a matter of uh, refreshing your mind by doing something else and then returning to, uh, to these things. But really talk to other people uh, to see what is the best way to move forward. Also by collaborating with other people, you get less risk uh, to get stuck because if you're in isolation, only you yourself, then uh, it will be more difficult. Um, okay, so that's again isolation. I just mentioned this. So that's one of the difficult things that you should really avoid. Don't uh, stay alone and don't work all of the time you yourself. Of course, you have your own specific topic. Uh, your advisor hopefully knows about the topic. And in that case, he can help you, but he doesn't always have the time to help you. In that case, hopefully you can talk to other PhD students uh that are also in a similar topic even if they are not in the similar topic it still helps to talk to them uh and uh, if you know other people other researchers outside of your group working on related topics talk to them uh, as well it will remove your isolation and it will also get you new ideas new uh, results um uh, the the thing about your advisor that might not always be there to help you this occasionally happens if especially your pg advisor is not really a specialist in your chosen domain of research uh, this occasionally also happened to me as a phd advisor uh, and in that case basically the only way out because i cannot give the best advice i could to my phd students in that case uh, it's to well, basically up to the PhD students or the advisor to seek other collaborators outside that are better experts and that help the student uh, whenever uh, he needs uh, advice on this. This was, for example, the case with the student I mentioned that's doing the augmented and virtual reality stuff. That's why he sought um, collaborations with another university. Uh, okay, so um, you know, just a couple of slides for this. So once you have done the PhD, the question is what's next? What is the life after the PhD? Basically, you have two choices. Either you go for a professional career or you go for an academic career. I will not go into all of the things for the academic career because I have too many slides on this. Uh, for a professional career, this is more difficult because you have done like a PhD for four years, six years. If it's not a practically oriented PhD, it might be difficult. So basically, it could happen that you think by yourself, my PhD, everything I did over the last four years, six years, will not really be it cannot be valorized by a, by a by a company 
sometimes indeed company says we don't see what's the point of doing a phd uh we are not going to uh well give you extra money that's maybe not a big deal but uh at least knowing that you are hiring someone that has a phd it can actually be beneficial um and actually you should realize that as a PhD student, once you get your PhD, you have lots of skills that you have acquired that you can actually sell. So you have lots of transversal skills. You are autonomous. You have lots of new technical skills that you have acquired, lots of writing skills, presentation skills, planning, collaboration, communication skills. All of these things that I mentioned here are transversal skills that you have acquired during your PhD and that you can actually sell. They are really very useful also in a company setting. So these are the things that you should focus on as things in your CV when you want to go to a company about where you, uh, why you are a good person to work in this company. So basically, uh, rigorous thinking, abstract thinking, the ab ability to solve problems, the ability to work on a long-term goal without clear short-term rewards. Just look at this list here and you will notice that all of these actually naturally uh, are a consequence of uh, things you do during a PhD. And these are the things that are valued by a company. It's not the PhD per se, it's these transversal skills. So that's how you can sell yourself uh, to a company if the company by itself does not value the PhD diploma itself. For a post of career, if you want to actually stay in research, in that case, you have to go from the three ball juggler to a six one uh, ball one. Uh, and that case, basically, uh, you have to uh, basically continue to get more involved, organize more, publish more, collaborate more, uh, network more. Also, perhaps uh, three new th things, teaching, get involved in teaching. That's probably not something that you always have to do in a PG. Sometimes you can uh, apply for funding, writing project proposals and getting them accepted is also something you need to learn. It's quite different from writing and accepting a project proposal than writing and accepting a paper. Uh, so maybe I will just <laughs> skip all of this slide and go to that one. Um, so I said I had too much slides. So applying for funding, there's lots of different funding opportunities. So the first step is to identify the funding opportunities and then try to go for it. And then you, uh, well, you write a pro research proposal and then you hope it will get accepted. If it gets accepted, you're lucky. Uh, but sometimes you have a really good proposal, uh, for example, here, final grading, A, excellent. And then the decision of the Science Foundation will be rejection due to a lack of financial means. Uh, this happens, but it could also happen that you have a, a lousy proposal and then, of course, it's rejected. Uh, but uh, in that case, basically, you're starting to cry and despair. Don't despair, just uh, continue and try again. It's the same as you do with your papers. It's not because one paper gets rejected that you stop. Just to try again, improve it until it gets accepted. Um, the same is for uh, if you want to like get tenure. So you're going to find positions, academic positions, associate, uh, well, maybe first assistant professor and then later. Uh, so there again, you're probably are going to apply in different places. The first place you apply for might not, might not accept you. So in that case, instead of crying and despairing, just uh, continue again and um, use your experience that you gained uh, to try again and at the meantime uh, continue your uh, improving your academic uh, profile uh, so this is more or less the la last slide so uh, as a result so what you should aim for is actually this one this kind of i don't know it's an indian goddess i think it's shiva i'm not sure um, I should ask my uh, students in uh, where you are a, a, well, a juggler with lots of different balls. If it helps if you have many more hands because then you can still keep all of the, the balls in the air uh, and do lots of different things. Uh, well, hopefully not all in parallel, but more in sequentially, but uh, all of these different things you have to do to improve your uh, skills. 